Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I'm really excited to have Von Glitschka on today. I've had him on before and I met him at conferences and he's definitely one of my heroes, an amazing illustrator, but also super humble and ready to just kind of share some wisdom. So Von, thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, anytime. All right, well guys, we're just gonna jump in. So maybe some of you have heard of Vaughn, I hope so. If not, um, we'll give you a little basic. So Vaughn, can you give us just a little bit of your background and maybe talk a little bit about your business background and then where your love for design and illustration really began? Well, uh, before I started my own firm, I worked for other places for 15 years uh, from my first job was a hole in the wall screen print shop in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, from there, I moved along to other companies like a sportswear company, moved to Oregon, started working for a small design firm and worked there for about uh, during the mid nineties for about seven years and then moved to California, started working at Upper Deck and I was a essentially an art director at Upper Deck and worked there for about four years, moved back to Oregon, uh, was an art director at a small little design firm here in town. And then uh, a couple years after that, um, shortly after 9-11, I kind of got the boot. I came in one day and my boxes were packed. Uh, long story short, it ended me starting my own uh, firm in 2002 and I've been doing that ever since uh, most of the work we do um, actually it hasn't become we until last year when I hired my daughter but uh, most of the work I do is uh, brand centric so uh, just this past week I was working on a couple uh, couple national brands for a couple different ad agencies I'm kind of like a hired gun for them and that usually makes up the vast majority of the work I do. So now my daughter's working with me. So um, the projects that come in that uh, I don't really want to do, I can have her do now. So <laughs> that's kind of nice. Well, and uh, something else we're going to talk about a little later, it also allows you to take on a little bit more work because yeah. you have her. And you kind of did a test um, with her when she was in school, right? Yeah, when um, she was going through the design program at the local college, um, I would hire her as a freelancer. So a lot of people didn't know that. So she was kind of doing work for me for like two years prior to me hiring her. So um, it was actually her and her boyfriend, who was also going through the design program at the time, uh, both of them helped me to work out the Dungeons and Dragons branding that we created. So. Cool. That's awesome. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. Have you always drawn? Have you always been interested in design? I know. Um, so maybe in high school, you kind of wanted to do something else, but the Seattle um, school kind of came in. Do you want to talk about that just a little bit? Yeah. When I was a freshman, um, I had to pick an elective class and I was looking down the list and there was one called printing and I thought that was kind of different. I'd never done anything commercial design wise. So I took that and basically what the class ended up being was they had an in kind of in school print service for whatever they needed for teachers and the administration. And in this class, I learned production from paste up through at that time is all analog. So shooting on a stat camera, creating film, burning plates, setting up on the press and actually printing it. So we would get projects and we'd have to go through the whole process and then turn everything in and get graded on it. And I remember Mr. Ripley was the, the teacher and he said, look, the only thing you can't do in this class is it can't be for an actual business. You have to make pretend stuff or stuff for you. And um, I created a business card and I just picked a name, Bulldog Trucking, laid out a business card and went through that whole process, got a print, turned it in. Mr. Ripley calls me into his office and he goes, I thought I told you, you know, we can't, you're not supposed to do a real business. And I go, that's not. And he's going, he's looking at me like he doesn't believe me. And he like picks up the phone, he's staring at me and he punches in the number on the card. And it goes to my house. It was to our house. 
and my mom picks up on the phone, hello, you know, is this bulldog trucking? No, this is, this is the Glitchka residence. Okay, well, this is Mr. Ripley, the teacher at blah, blah, blah. Uh, your son's doing good. Thank you. Click. <laughs> and, and, and from that point forward, he let me do anything I wanted. So I was designing my own notepads and all kinds of stuff. It was fun. So that's where I initially kind of got the bug to see what I could do if it was commercial art. Um, but I still wanted to kind of go into film and... <laughs> my career counselor came back. This is like my, either the end of my junior or senior year and said, I can't find any information on that. So somebody came in from the Seattle Art Institute and that's where I decided to go. Well, I think that was a good uh, choice. So how far was that from the Glitchka residence? How, how, how far was that? That's a, an hour. I oh. grew up in Olympia, Washington and Seattle, just about an hour. Oh, yeah. so not too bad. No, far but, enough away from my parents that I felt like, you know, I was free. <laughs> yeah. <sorts. laughs> my mom would not like me to say that too, but I also felt the <laughs> same way. Mine was two and a half, two and a half hours away. So I was um, happy. It's just good. I think it's important to make your own kind of start being an adult, you know, but with yes. like really big strings attached because they're your safety note and you're not really an adult yet, but you do have to clean your own room and wash your own clothes and things like that. All right. So the next question was, so you've had the successful career. And one of the things I really look up to you about is that you have been able, you've been able to kind of diversify. And that's kind of, I call this show growth and diversification because you really are a great example of growing and then how you've diversified. And for me, I've seen you as an author, as a teacher for Linda. So I have my students watch you. I've watched you. Um, I've definitely bought a ton of your books, but I also know that you are an amazing illustrator. So, but you've done branding uh, and then now you've made products with our mutual friend, Dustin. So there's all kinds of things that you're doing. And I think that that's um, one of the ways that you're able to kind of um, continue to go, even when the 2008 hits and the downturn in the economy kind of happens. So um, when you've been doing this, cause you've created brushes, textures, all kinds of things. Um, you've taken photos and made those textures, something that you could sell. Um, what are some of the other ways that you areas that you've been, able to be maybe most successful or that have been a really good success, maybe passive income wise, um, as in both time invested, um, and then money earned and, and how much you've enjoyed it. I, I think I told you this previously that I kind of, it's easier to look back now and kind of make sense of some things. Whereas in the moment, you don't always recognize uh, where something's going to go. But uh, later on, you can look back in hindsight and really kind of understand, uh, for, at least for me, it seems like a path adventure at times. Um, so when a, an opportunity presents itself, um, I'm at the standpoint now where I never kind of, I try not to take those, those moments for granted. I, um, and I certainly don't, answer quickly by saying no. Um, I, I always consider stuff because I've just seen, it's just, it's happened too many times to just be mere chance. It's, I think that's how you make those connections. We all have heard that adage. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And I think a lot of that who you know happens by uh, forcing yourself to move in a direction that you might not naturally want to move and uh, that certainly was the case for me when years ago I was approached by a local college and they said hey would you come in and audit our program and I'm like I'm busy I don't have time to do that and I was about ready to say no and then the more I thought about it I go fine I'll do it I'll you know get back to the community or whatever and I showed up kind of with a crappy attitude not really wanting to be there and after I was there for an hour and I started talking to some other people that showed up, it, it wasn't that bad. I got to know the program locally and um, got to meet the chair and talk to her. And um, she started following my newsletter at that time. 
And about a year later, she approached me and said, hey, would you want to teach in our program? And I'm like, I'd never done that before. And, um, you know, first thing I said is I go, I don't have a bachelor's degree. I only have an associate. So, you, so I don't think I can, you know. And she said, I don't care about that. You have the experience. And mm -hmm. so she let me come in and kind of set up. Uh, how I wanted to teach at that time. They wanted me to do all these classes, and I said, I can only commit to one, and it has to be in the evening, one day a week, one term. And they worked with me, and I did that for about eight years. And um, through the process of doing that, I'd never taught before, I kind of discovered, and it's like nobody told me how you go about teaching, so I wasn't really trying to mimic anything. I was just kind of winging it, and then along the way, I realized when I showed some projects I was working on to the students in my design client work, uh, they really responded to it well. And so I started documenting that and putting these tutorials together, which are process based just from beginning to end and um, was sharing those. I mean, before social media, mm -hmm. so I was sharing those on the how design forum and people even there liked them. And so I set up a website called illustrationclass.com and offered them there. And that eventually led to being asked to write a book from how, because um, I was on the design forum so much posting information that somebody posted, uh, what book would you like to see? And I've always had a, um, text file on my desktop that I can open up really quick and just type in ideas mm -hmm. just to capture them. And I shared some ideas with them that led to them having me pitch a book led to me doing my first book that turned around and led to me speaking at the how conference, in which case I got in front of a publisher. They liked what I was doing and asked me to write a book. And so like one thing kind of leads to another, but I can look back on it now and realize none of that would have happened if I wouldn't have decided, okay, I'm going to take a couple hours and just do something I really don't want to do at the time. And because of it, everything else can be tied back to that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, people tend to think like it, it's none of that was planned. It just, it happened, but it only happened because I'm willing, I was willing to, try something different. And every time it never fails, every time there's been an opportunity like that, I don't know at the moment if it will lead to anywhere, because sometimes it doesn't. Um, more times than not, it does. And it does in some pretty cool ways. And um, so I think that's the best way to kind of build a network. And you can compound that happenstance by you know, just connecting with people, like wherever you're working at now, you may not be on your own. Uh, just don't burn bridges, you know, right. Get along with people. And when you leave, eventually, if they like you, they like what you do, they're going to come back at some point later on down the road when they're in a different position. And that's how I got the Dungeons and Dragons job. It was my, uh, the guy I shared an office with at Upper Deck, he's now a creative director at Blizzard. He's a friend of the Hasbro guy that works at Wizards of the Coast. And he had emailed David and said, hey, do you know anybody I could hire to help with this D&D &D branding? He says, yeah, contact Vaughn. That would have never happened if I wouldn't have, you know, for if I would have been a jerk to Dave way back <laughs> 11 years ago. So uh, it all works together, but and in funny ways, too, like a local TEDx event wanted me to design their TEDx. And I've been doing that for the last four years, but one of their themes a couple of years ago was mm -hmm. called Fearless. And the whole premise was, okay, trying new things can be fearful, but embrace that fear, step out of your comfort zone, try new things. And so I felt if I was going to brand that, I had to do that in the branding process. So. I decide, I forced myself to design uh, the logo type by hand, meaning paint, temper paint, a brush. And I just started painting out all these letter forms. And in the process of doing that, I came up with a cool design I would have otherwise never done. And then in the process of doing that, I discovered, wow, this is making a really cool painterly look. 
-hmm. And then that gave me the idea to come up with these brushes in Illustrator, and it led to a whole new style. You know, Adobe's hired me a couple times to work in that style for different marketing things from them. And then I turned around. I was going to sell my stuff on uh, Creative Market, and then I met Dustin, and I go, well, he, it's, it's the other people's audience methodology. It, actually, if anybody hasn't read a book called Creativity, Inc., Mm -hmm. I highly recommend it. Ed Catmull, one of the founders mm -hmm. of uh, Pixar, wrote it. And he talks about other people's audience. And so that's what me and Dustin have done is we've combined forces to provide cool assets for um, other creatives. I don't know if you, you hear my phone. I'm s no. <laughs> no. Hopefully that, it's not anybody. A, no, that's a robocall, I think. so. <laughs> okay. So one of the things I also hear what you're saying is that one, you were active in forums, you were reaching out, you were sharing things always. Um, and you also weren't afraid to share something, um, create something maybe in a new technology that you weren't familiar with. If you were creating videos or something, you figured it out. Um, even back to freshman year, high, you know, high school, you were just, you were, nothing kind of stopped you. Cause I feel like sometimes that happens to some people and they're like, I just can't figure it out. I'm going to let it go. And I feel like sometimes it's just about staying in the race and, and staying in the game. I don't know if you feel like that or not, but it also sounds like being nice and having a positive attitude about an opportunity. Not every single opportunity that you've had has um, been amazing probably, but because you say yes, lots of times it allows for lots more opportunities, I guess, in the future. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. There, there's a great interview somebody did with David Bowie uh, five, six years ago. It's a video interview and, and he's talking about uh, the creative process. I mean, he's specifically referencing music, but it applies to anything creative wise. And he says his whole concept was, you know, fear is part of the creative process. So when you start, for instance, wading out offshore, on a coastline and you get to the point where you can't quite touch bottom and you're not sure about yourself and your abilities. He's saying he made the point that that's when great things happen. Right. And, and so I think that's so true in terms of the context of creativity is that there's been projects that have come my way and I look at it initially and I'm like really intimidated by it. Like I haven't really done anything like this. I think I might be able to do it, but it's like, I, I just don't overthink it. I just say yes. And then I try to figure out how to pull it off. And that can be kind of, kind of scary, but it also leads to a lot better work I've found by um, not letting fear hinder you, but using it as a fulcrum to realize and actually recognize when you have an opportunity to do something that's going to, be really cool because if fear is not part of the creative process, um, I'd argue you're not trying hard enough. Right. Well, I think um, I can't imagine you being intimidated by anything because you have you do have a lot of different styles. You don't seem to let things stop you, and um, I think you have a really great sense of humor, uh, which I think comes into the five minute logos. It definitely comes into when you <laughs> speak for sure. Um, so Tim frames one of our. Uh, fellow friends and the last interview. So I try to make sure I get through every interview, but this was a question that I wasn't sure was okay to ask, but I made sure it was this time um, because he sent it to me the night before or that morning or something the last time. So Tim wanted to know how much money have you made from five minute logos? <laughs> well, first off, for those who don't know what five minute logos are there, it, it's not, it's, an official non-legit way to brand your business or um, <laughs> create your new uh, tramp stamp tattoo. It, it doesn't matter how you want to use it. Um, it's a brand parody service at five minute logo.com. And I started it. This goes back a little over four years now when no, even longer than that, I, I got my first iPad and I decided, um, I wonder if I could create a logo on this. And I was just joking around and just drew some crummy little logo. And 
it kind of entertained myself. And so it was Black Friday the next day. So I decided just as a joke on Twitter to say, uh, for the next 24 hours, you send me five bucks via PayPal and I'll, I'll draw you a five minute logo. <laughs> I had like 42 people who, <laughs> who took me up on that. And I'm like, going, hmm, this isn't a bad way to, you know, support my coffee habit. So, <laughs> right. so I came up with the idea of the five minute logo site and it kind of took off when I first launched it. And it, it's, it's gone viral two times, one time here in the States and one time the equivalent of Boing Boing in Brazil. I forget the name of the site. And so I was doing all these like, and I don't know if they really got the joke of it. It's <laughs> like, so there's probably a lot of pizza places down in Brazil with five minute logos on their signage or whatever, <laughs> but it's all sarcastic. I, it's like the rules of engagement make it pretty clear on the site that I don't guarantee you'll like it. Uh, more than not, you won't like it or you, you won't be able to use it. And, um, I do whatever I want. And if you're okay with that, then it costs five bucks, you know? And if and, you don't like it, I'll redo it again, but you have to pay near five bucks. So, right. And so there's no guarantee. There was one at Creative South when you presented this, you were talking and you, it was like for a church or something. And I just, it was like something about high. And instead of, it was like, they oh, were not uh, yeah, thinking yeah, 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 of yeah. it being like pot high or drug side, but that's what you did it. And no, I thought it, that was it was, it got posted on a site called church marketing sucks. <laughs> and once again, I don't think people actually read if they read the site, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. They will know this is a parody. Some people just don't read the site. And so I got one from high point Baptist church. <laughs> right. So it's pretty simple what I'm going to do for that. I'm going to draw a little church smoking a doobie. And, and I, don't, I never heard back. I, I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall at times. But, yeah, there's that one. I got another one from a lady from that same time they posted on that site. It was for, um, oh, a VBS. It just this little light of mine. So I do this gnarly-looking angler fish with the, you know, the – luminescent thing that comes off the top of the head actually it looked pretty cool i think it'd be a great theme but you know i did hear back from her she just goes well that'll scare the kids i go yeah <laughs> you know that's the way it goes <laughs> i think it's accurate though so that's funny no but i'll sh i i do have the link that you can see a bunch of them on the facebook page here okay mm -hmm. awesome thank you and i posted it up there too i'm trying to be your dj so Oh, so the, the total, I've done a little, I believe it's at least over 3,500 since then. So you can do the math. Right. That's pretty good. Yeah. So, I usually let them come in during the week and then on Sunday night, I'll draw them out before, you know. Do you ever spend more than five minutes? Oh yeah. All the time. <laughs> I do it, if, especially if it's going to be funny, then, um, yeah, there's some that some guy ordered last week, and it was he likes Texas A and M, and he likes big wrestling. So I did a cow skull, and instead of the horns, they're just two arms with biceps. They're huge, and yeah. So that wasn't five minutes. That was probably fifteen minutes, but it was fun. So then you're these are all digital. You're not doing the. You're just practicing on yeah, the iPad. Actually. When Adobe first released their iPad app for vector drawing, it was called Adobe Ideas. It uh, worked really great. And then they updated it and the name to Adobe Illustrator Draw, but they removed um, a feature, and that feature was the ability to email a PDF of what you drew to anybody, and they locked it down so you'd have to have Creative Cloud in order to do that. And you still can't do it even today. So what I have is a, the first generation iPad Air, and I have the OS locked down, so it will never update, so I can keep using that old app. And so that's what I draw it in still. That's cool. And I think there's some, I've seen you, or a video of you doing some stuff on, and it may be on Linda that I've seen this, but where yeah. it's showing kind of how you're doing that. But that's really a, 
interesting kind of an, another way to use a tool, right? Yeah. All right. So, so we answered Tim's question finally. So can you talk about when in your career that and did you ever take on retainer clients or was that as when you started running your own business, was that something you were going out after or how were you billing and, and things like that? So people who are thinking about going out on their own, what, what do you suggest them to do? Well, initially I would have entertained a retainer client. I just really never was presented with that opportunity. Almost everything I do, well, not almost, everything I quote now is just flat rate quotes based off of the specific deliverables they need. Um, the closest I've come to retainers, I've had a few accounts. So I was the agency of record, for example, for a trampoline company in Australia. And um, initially they contacted me just to design a pattern for their pad that goes around the trampoline. Mm -hmm. And um, from that, I rebranded his company. We renamed it, rebranded it, recreated all of his marketing material. Um, he grew his company in the first uh, five months after we rebranded by 20%. And then he was my client for about two or three years until he grew so big, he had to bring uh, marketing and design in-house. And that's, that's always the problem when you have a client like that is if you help them grow, it gets to a point where um, it's more efficient for them to move everything inside. So we're still friends, but I don't do any more work for them. And that's happened two or three times over the years with different clients I've had. Another client, a tech company, if you've ever heard of Barracuda Networks, you know, for email threat assessment, that kind of stuff, uh, that's what this company did. They're called Endpulse. And over the years, as they rolled out each new product, I would brand it and I'd help develop their marketing material, all their trade show stuff. And he continued to grow his company to the point where he got acquired by um, another threat assessment company called FireEye, who their contract is, sorry, their contract is the Department of Homeland Security. And so he's retired now and he never has to work again. But the nice thing about that is because I helped him be successful in his business, he now as an entrepreneur who has a very large bank account, <laughs> he goes out and he buys a vineyard. And so now I branded that for him. He started a, company, a coffee company. I branded that for him. He just uh, worked out new technology. He's going to market to the vineyard industry. I just branded that for him. So it's a lot of fun. He's become a really good friend too. So uh, now he's just a, a maverick entrepreneur and I'm his branding guy. So uh, that's usually how I handle quoting stuff is usually project by project and just flat rates. All right. So um, if, so it, that's the question I don't know. Like if you have these repeat things, you just kind of give them each time they come back to you. And I've always thought, well, you know, some of these people are coming to me pretty regularly. And so I would think that a retainer would be a great way to do it. And then it's guaranteed kind of income. But I do think it, I'm, I don't have any retainer clients and I, I don't know, like I'm fine. I just do kind of like you as a project by project. But I think sometimes it takes some, um, faith, I think. I mean, I have had great clients that have become friends, and I think a lot of it is about relationships, and yeah. um, it's not about how big they are. I mean, you've done work for huge companies, but then I love that you also still do work for small startups and, and things like that, and I do think it's about um, creating the relationship and letting, you know, I don't if the client's part of the process or they just they really trust you. You're building trust on every logo or every project that you do. Yeah. I don't know if that's, if you, I mean, I feel like relationships are probably our most important thing that we have. We can. That's the most enjoyable part for it. For me is like when I work with a large agency, they know what they're doing. They have their define process and their protocol and everything else. And I just adapt to it. So they'll send me a creative brief. I read it and I'm just 
I'm the design monkey for them. I'm just pulling off the style, the specific assets they need. Once they get that, it's like out of sight, out of mind. They're off and running. And it's usually about a year or more before I ever hear back and see how it ever came out. Um, and I'm okay with that because, you know, they, they pay good. I don't have to hold their hand. They know what they're doing. Right. So in that case, I, I like working with those clients, but I really like working with the small business owner. Um, so here's a small little example from last year. Uh, this happened around July or, or June or July of last year. I get contacted by a uh, husband and wife. They own a company, an HVAC heating and cooling electrician company uh, based out of Chicago. And they had gone through 99 designs to get their uh, branding done. They really didn't like it. They were kind of disenfranchised with the whole process. And when they and the way they found me is they went back online to try to figure out okay what can we do to get what we actually want, and uh, apparently they found my course on uh, logo development. And they said, "Why don't we just contact this guy and see what he can do?" And when they contacted me, the first thing I told them is they need to contact Ninety Nine Designs and ask for a refund to get their money back. And, and I said, and if you're able to do that, then come back to me and I'll work with whatever budget you have to help you out. And they did. They got their money back. They came to me. I gave them a quote. They approved it. And then the next day, he kind of got buyer's remorse. He was just really gun shy by that, by that point. And I just, Frank, I just told him flat out, I go, look, this is the guarantee I'll make with you. If you don't like what I do, you don't owe me anything. And they're going, okay, we'll, we'll do it. And the first thing that I did, as I said, the first thing we need to address is your name. His name is Dan Foss is the owner. So his, the name of his company at that point was DF Mechanical. And I go, if you just said DF Mechanical, is anybody going to understand what's that about? Does that say anything? Is that a good brand name? And I said, I don't think it is. We need to redo your name. And so we went through the process that I use, create a brief follow-up questions. I do my own research. And in the process, he shares with me that most of the people that work with him tend to describe him as a one-stop shop. And I kind of focused, uh, focused on that one-stop. And I go, I kind of like that. And so I started just doing name exploration. I came up with one-stop and I was dropping in different words. And then I have GoDaddy open when I'm doing that because... Yeah. It's it's not worth pursuing if I can't get a domain. Right. And, and so I type in one stop pro. Nobody owns the dot com. And so I contact him immediately and I said, this is your new name. We're not going to talk about it. This is what you need to go with. It's one stop pro dot com. You can own it. The reason why I'm pushing so hard is this is a franchise worthy name. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not kidding. It's like you go with this and you grow your business, you'll be able to sell franchises based off of the name alone, let alone everything else. And so we launched, we rebranded them, created everything, vehicle wraps. Um, I like to say truth in advertising. So on his vehicle wraps, it says seven, like he has a fleet of vehicles. He only has two, you know, but <laughs> it makes it look bigger. It intimidates his competition. Right. That's, why, that's how I sell it to him. Uh, but in August, we launched that. And by the end of December, I get an email from him. He's already on target for 2017 to double his revenue. And it's That's just be just because of his, his uh, rebranding. So I'm going to show it because um, I love this. I actually um, saw this when I was just, you know, I don't know, when I creep around at people who I'm going to interview. But I love the one as the counter um, inside the inn. But then the little guy is so cute, you know, and I, my dad worked for Georgia Power for all his years. So like plugs, like, do you know what, uh, Ready Kilowatt, do you know who that is? Yeah, I know who that so, is. I love that little guy. So that's why Design Recharge is always like a, you know, outlet plug. So I just really liked this one. And so I think you guys can still see. So again, these are all the different kind of ways, secondary branding and then your, your service so they did um they got a lot for what you what you gave them 
Yeah, I've kind of added to this post. So uh, originally it was just his logo and basic assets, but we've developed his brochure, his advertising, simple little marketing things you can do for lead behinds. That's awesome. I, I, I love it. So um, I'm going to stop share. So, but it's fun. Uh, the colors are fun. I love that you helped him come up with his name because again, sometimes we don't, they, we get people that have a name that doesn't make sense or that maybe isn't going to be helpful to them. So I love that. That's awesome. Now going, going back to the whole, um, uh, kind of building a relationship, like I, I've never met this guy, but after we launched it and he started to get feedback on it from people who would see it, it's like they're always, um, it, 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 kind of, it, it kind of makes me laugh because I'll always get an email from him and say, you know, I've had my business for like eight years and nobody's ever come up to me and said, wow, that's a really cool logo. And like this last week, we've had like 15 or, you know, so people come up to it and say, did you like buy into a national like franchise? And, and I go, boom, that's it. It's like, and I go, your perceived value mm -hmm. is just increased. But um, he's even had a couple other people in the Chicago area uh, who are graphic designers or art directors and go, who designed that? That's really cool. And I'm like, yes, I like that. That's nice. <laughs> that is so, good. No, it's just exciting to see them get excited about, you know, their business and see how it's going to um, help them run it and improve. Well, it's like I always say, we are dream makers. Like that's one thing I love about being a designer. Somebody can come to you with their dream and now you make it look real. And then other people, it is about how people perceive you and, Hopefully they will trust us. I think that's the other big thing is hopefully they get that with expertise. So earlier on, you were working for big companies, you worked for small studios, and then you went on on your own. I know with every job you had, you probably weren't able to do it all on your own, but there it goes back to relationships. So who would you get? I know you, um, you've worked with Paul and and tim and so how did how did those kind of relationships start or did you already know them through the online or for, from the design community and then you were overloaded so you asked them to work as contractors is that kind of how it would work um i've worked with them uh, within the last eight years or so as contractors that i brought on for various projects um but like for paul for example um, this even goes back, well, it was right after I had started my own firm and I had a rep based out of Toronto called Three in a Box for my illustration. And I was just getting ready to leave them and find a new rep. And at that time, Paul was coming into them. He had, they had just signed him up to rep him. And so I liked his work. I saw some of the things he did, so I contacted him and I said, hey, I've never met you, but I really like your work. And, and uh, he kind of uh, started communicating with me and we decided we were both gonna go to an illustration conference back in 2003 and we hung out and that's when I really got to know him and we've been friends ever since. So um, he's, he's one of the most talented guys uh, in the industry. A lot of people don't realize this, but he worked right out of art school with Charles Anderson and was part of that core team that developed the signature look that everybody knows Charles Anderson for. So uh, uh, Paul's, Paul's not only a great illustrator, he's an amazing uh, graphic designer as well. And uh, have you ever seen that old cartoon by Hanna-Barbera, Hillbilly Bear? No. Okay, where where he's like really kind of kind of talks. Is, oh, and he has kind of a hat that's yeah, kind of messed up, yeah. and he has like a piece of <laughs> straw or something. Yes, yeah. I knew, yeah. Okay. That that's basically Paul. <laughs> that's he's <laughs> he's gonna hate me for this, but uh, he's very low key. But he's he has a great sense of humor, and he's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. I met him at Creative South um, a couple years ago, super humble, similar yeah. to you as 
you know, if you don't know what somebody looks like, uh, you again know their work, but you don't. And so he was like up on the second floor, just hanging out. And I was, you know, I just, I was like, is this, this is your first year? Let me introduce you around. So I didn't know he knew you, but found that out later. But he is super nice, super humble guy. So you've worked alone. You hire Savannah as how what like what year in school did you hire Savannah to do contract? Well, it was after she graduated. Oh. And I wasn't gonna hire her. My original mindset was I want her to go find a job somewhere and get some different experience. And then maybe after a couple of years, I'd consider hiring her. And uh, the way the, the economy and industry is in, in this area we live, it's like there just wasn't any opportunity for any jobs that were opening up. And so I was just sitting here one night thinking, I'm just going, okay, I can basically say this is the style I want, this is what I need to create and give it to her and she can do it. So why don't I just hire her? So I just talked to, like, I'm not, I don't do my own bookkeeping. My wife does our basic bookkeeping for the business and we have a CPA that does all the other, whatever you call it. Um, I, I, really, I really don't <laughs> like that kind of stuff at all. So I just call up our CPA and I said, this is what I'm thinking. I want to hire my daughter. I'm thinking this much salary, can I afford it? And he came back and he said, well, unless you're doing stuff that I don't know about, you should be able to afford it. So, so it's gone, it's gone, it's gone really well. It's like, I mean, it's always kind of scary to take on um, a commitment like that. You know, when it's just myself, I only have to worry about keeping myself busy. Right. Now it's a different dynamic having to, like I'm getting ready in a couple of weeks to go down to lynda.com um, and shoot a course down there on copyright. And I just realized today I need to figure out what I want Savannah to be working on while I'm gone. And, you know, that's kind of new for me. I'm still kind of getting used to that. So Hannah asks, how easy or difficult is it for you to work with your daughter? Does she come into the, are, do you have a home office? Yeah, I have a, a, a studio office in my home. Um, in the top floor, we had a separate room uh, that was empty. So we turned that into another studio and she works out of there, at least now. Eventually, she's um, probably in the next few years, she's probably going to get married and move out and then will still work the same way. It'll just be a little remote. Gotcha. Well, yeah. and then it's kind of nice. So she's still yeah. living at home yes. right now. Yeah. So yeah. she goes to her own part of the third floor, I guess. Yeah. The second floor. Now um, we have, I have a network set up where uh, a networked uh, Drobo. So all of the work files are on there. So she could access that actually from anywhere. Oh, well, um, that's good. So yeah. is there any tips of things so that you would tell somebody, because maybe somebody doesn't have a kid that they're going to work, but if they're working for a family member, a, a sibling or a parent or even maybe a, a child or, or even a close friend, what are some things to kind of look out for? Um, or pros and cons. You know, I, I, if, if you, if you don't like, I don't know if I can answer this. It's like my daughter, it's like we get along so well together. Um, and she's always been kind of passionate about creative things. So uh, I remember when she was 11, she came into my office when I was working one day and she just said, I want to do what you do for a living. And so she's known for quite a while kind of what she wanted to do. And uh, she's had the passion to kind of fuel that. And, and she, besides doing the projects for us and our business, she has her own creative explorations she works on for no other reason than she enjoys it. So she's been working on a, if you go into her office on one wall, it's like those crime movies you see where they discover the lair of the serial killer and he has all these photos with pins and lines and string going everywhere. 
she doesn't have the string, but she has all the images on her wall, and it's all of her character exploration for a web comic that she's developing. And um, beyond that, she loves manga, so she's mm -hmm. um, always doing these art prints, going to the conventions, having her own booth, and you know, over three days, she'll make twenty five hundred dollars selling art prints. So um, she has her own kind of thing she likes doing on the side, but um, when it comes to working together, uh, you know, we get along really well and we work well together. So she's a lot like me in terms of the way she thinks. So it's, I mean, it sounds kind of weird, but it's like having a clone at times. It's like, <laughs> it's like, I know exactly what I need done and I'll show her the style and it's like pushing, okay, you know, this style click, uh, this theme click, uh, start. <laughs> and it's like, she comes back and I'm okay. I'll show you guys something. So I do these weekly things for lynda.com and somebody asked a question about how do you set, what's the best way to set up art for screen printing? So we're going to do, I'm going to do one little episode on that. And so I just told Savannah, come up with some design you want to do that I can use to demonstrate this. And this is something she just came up mm -hmm. with yesterday, but it's just something she just came up with out of her head, but it's like, I'm looking at it and I'm just going, man, you're good with your vector art. <laughs> she is, is. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool. So her, I shared her Instagram, which that image is on her Instagram and it's Savannah, yeah. S A V A N N A H F A E R I E. I don't know what I, I, Got stumped on the eye, I guess. She misspelled fairy years ago and she never corrected it. <laughs> I, I can't, I don't, she likes it, so whatever. Yeah, know. it works for her. That, <laughs> do you think she would have any pros and cons for working for you? Uh, she might, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not something you talk about? Well, like when <laughs> we're doing cutesy little characters for something, she has this this rule that she just won't budge on. And that is it can't have a nose. It's like, it can't be a cutesy little uh, hmm. personality if it has a nose. And I'm going, what are you talking about? You know, you know what? She's changed my mind because she keeps pointing out images that prove her point. I'm going, okay. I kind of get it. <laughs> so trust me, this is what people my age think. And I go, okay, I, whatever. So there's so, some benefits of having somebody that's a few generations behind you that, uh, because they may be more in touch with some things and they can point some yeah. things out, right? That's one of the things you had kind of said earlier. Yeah. And it goes the other way too. So we'll be working on, we were working on a branding project and some, well, some characters for a project last week. Um, and I, I said, this looks great. I like it. But you need to keep in mind that, and it's only because of experience that I know we'll run into this problem if we do this and not do this. And she doesn't always understand that. So that's usually when um, I'll explain things. And she's not, you know, she's far more acceptable to art direction than I was at her age. Hmm. It's like, I used to fight it. I used to fight it with like, it just bugged me if somebody, if the art director had come in, oh, you need to do this and that. And and it only bugged me after the fact when I look back is because um, that art director actually still to this day, this goes back 20 years, still doesn't use a computer. He would come sit like right behind me and go, okay, nudge it this way, nudge it this way. Mm -hmm. And back then, okay, here's something that I did that I probably shouldn't have done back then. Um, I was using freehand. So I knew that uh, he was going to show up and art direct me in a few minutes. So I'd make a copy of my file. I'd open that up. And then he would come in and little, literally nudge this way, the nudge button on your computer, move mm -hmm. things over. He'd do his little massages and then, okay, it's fine. Then he'd get up and leave. And I'd just throw that file away and go with what I had. <laughs> They never noticed. He never mm -hmm. noticed, you know, and I know that's, I should not have done that, but <laughs> I did. But it, it got, it got you through and it really was small little nitpicky kind of thing. Some, 
So, so sometimes I think it might be hard for somebody to work for a family member because um, either there's, but you do trust her also. I think that that's important to kind of yeah. um, note that you're not just like that guy who had to have his hand in everything and even little nudges. Yeah. You're, you're giving her that opportunity to teach you something as well. Well, here's the best part that I've learned about creative direction. And it came about when I left that job and went to Upper Deck, and it was a total different creative environment. I went from a small agency uh, for, that I worked at for seven years, and it was micromanaging everything. I go to Upper Deck, and they'd never give you complete control. It would be the, the owner who would have final say on everything. Then I go to Upper Deck. They give me this master schedule, the eight and a half or 11 by 17 printout XL this is when we start, here's all the meetings, here's all the deadlines, and we're launching on this date. And they just expect you to hit those dates, but nobody was there telling you, micromanaging everything. And here I show up and they hand me this outline for a new set content for uh, Major League Baseball and says, the budget for this release is 1.6 million and you're responsible for everything. And I was like, I never, managed anything like that before but you know what i like i loved it i love the fact that they didn't sit there and nitpick everything and because of that i learned to be introspective on myself and like how i take direction best and i remember taking my talking to my supervisor one day his name's vincent and just saying look if you want me to make a change or you really think something needs to be tweaked don't just come in and say this needs to change because I know myself well enough to know I'm just going to kind of resist that. But if you come in and say, Hey, you might think about this or that in a passive way, almost, um, almost always I'll make that change. I just noticed that about myself that I'd never noticed that before. And uh, once, and I think that happens when you start, working on your own things and you start paying attention to how best you process and think and approach things. And it used to bug me for years when I started working on my own that I felt, man, I'm such a procrastinator. It's like, why is it that, oh, I have a week and a half and like three days before something's due, I finally get around to starting it. Until I finally realized after like two or three years that I'm not a procrastinator. I just have to let things steep and think mm -hmm. about stuff for that long. And then it's, it's, I'm working on it, but not physically. It's all in my head. And then I have to get to a certain point and then I can move with it. Um, that's hard to, hard to, you can't universally define that for everybody, but I think everybody can figure it out for themselves. Absolutely. And, and, Maria says it has to marinate and it does. So, yeah. and that's why it's better maybe not to charge by the hour because you're not going to charge for the time you're in the shower and the time you're yeah. walking the dog and things like that. So Hannah has a question. She said, you posted the other day, a short video showing your drawing on the iPad pro had almost 250,000 anchor points. You mentioned yeah. you would need to clean it up. So what's your process for doing that? Uh, can I share my screen? I can show Absolutely. you exactly what I That need. would be awesome. Okay. How do I do that? Uh, it'll at the bottom uh, if you're looking at my face go to share screen and then you show your desktop or that window gotcha okay so can you see my desktop now no not yet you have to click oh, the gotcha there now we can see um now we can see your desktop okay so um this is artwork i'm talking about and if i go to keyline view oh you know what? This isn't the artwork I'm talking about. Hold on. I have to go to, okay. So I drew this artwork in initially on my iPad Pro using Apple Pencil and the Adobe Illustrator Draw app. And it looks good. And if I zoom in, you can see it has a nice aesthetic. But if I go to Keyline View, um, it's actually Ooh. made made up of every time my pen touched the uh -huh. iPad surface and drew a shape, this is what it'd do. So we're talking all of these shapes. If I just command A and select them, you can see over here this number, 243,849 anchor points. So 
Um, I had to clean that up. And the way I cleaned it up is initially, I just unite everything here. And this is just basically fusing everything together into one um, cohesive shape. And it reduces it down to 63,000, but it still has too many anchor points. And there's a lot of little stragglers like this. So mm -hmm. I'll go through and I'll delete all these little stragglers until I can get it down to something like this, which is uh, simplified down to 16,000 anchor points. And at this point is where I'll take what's called the smart remove brush and I'll just go over different areas. And what this does is it removes any unnecessary anchor points. And that's how I'll clean up the artwork. It, it takes a while to do that, but uh, when it's all said and done, then I end up uh, with just simple shapes like this. And all these are just simple white shapes. And on something like this, let me drag my layers folder over here. I'll just click through this really quick, but I'll just go in here, select white shapes. Um, I usually set up like mm -hmm. a palette over here. You have your palette in the swatches, but they're so small sometimes. I mm -hmm. like seeing them large. And then I'll just select shapes, select the eyedropper, and I'll just start coloring based off of those swatches. So. Um, at this point, it's just exploration. And I usually organize my layers so I can focus on one area at a time. So the face and uh, let's see, we'll do the headband, stems, these feathers, like this. And then I'll go back in, I'll do all the shading. So all of this is just using the blob brush to add little shading in different areas. And then the fun part is when I texturize mm -hmm. it. And these are just bitmap tiffs. So when it's all said and done, it ends up looking kind of like that. So that looks awesome. So Derek wants to know, is this um, personal or for a client? Uh, this was personal. This was just for fun. Um, um, I picked this because I am going to turn it into something. Um, but uh, that's something that, will hopefully, our tentative date to launch uh, what I'm uh, not completely revealing right now <laughs> is, will be the end of uh, July, and this will be part of that. So um, that's all I can really say about that right now. No but, problem, so I have a question. So you, you literally go back and after you've united, then you go back and you delete all those little things, or do you use that special curvy, I don't, can't remember what it was called, but whatever brush, and if you go over it, you said it would take some time. Is it take some time because it's processing, or is it take some time because you're just having to delete all these points? Or It'd be, It's easy just to show you really quick. So if okay. you take the blob brush and you just create, I don't know, doesn't matter what shape it is, like this, If I drew this in an Adobe Illustrator draw, let's go ahead and zoom in on this. Um, it would probably look like, let's go like this. Let's add some anchor points to it. <laughs> it would end up looking like this with all these anchor points. Mm -hmm. And so what I do is you can try to use a path and go to simplify in Illustrator, but it's, it's kind of that glove box mentality I was telling you about where I feel like I'm detached from the art and some mm -hmm. algorithm, I'm kind of controlling it with these stupid controls. And if you go like this and you go preview, you can see how it, yeah. it doesn't retain the aesthetic. So I never use that. So what I use is the Stute Graphics Vector Scribe has a smart remove brush right here and you can double click into it and adjust the size so we'll make it smaller. Like, okay, that's too small, uh, well, there. And what you can do is you just drag it over this and it will just smartly remove all the unnecessary anchor points in any kind of shape, organic or otherwise. And so you can go from something that has 148 anchor points to now it only has 28, but it doesn't screw up your artwork. 
And so that's the process I use to clean up that artwork that I brought in from the iPad because the iPad's great to draw it and to get that look and feel, but it is very, very messed up. And the reason why I didn't color it on the, uh, on the iPad is because it'll still, you still, if I ever wanted to print it, I'd still have to push it to my desktop and it'd be just a nightmare trying to separate. So I just focus on line work on the iPad clean it up, fill colors um, inside Illustrator, and then uh, utilize, uh, you know, the textures. Now, all my textures, some people will vectorize textures. I don't. These are all just bitmap TIFFs that are placed and colorized. Hey, I want to show you something. Can you go back to where it's just brown? It's only brown? Sure. Because I can draw on your thing, so I just want to show. Maybe I like want this? to draw. Yeah, look, it's like a person. Do you see? That's his eyes. That's his nose, and he's yelling. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's like Sasquatch from the side. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. Anyway, <laughs> that's what I saw. Sorry, I just had to share that with you. No, um, I like that. I do that all the time. Uh, yeah, or a Rasta person. So um, H Hannah said, that's amazing. Holy crap, that's great. Is this a plugin or, or in Illustrator? And it's by Astute Graphics. It is a plugin, yeah. right, that you yeah. purchase? It's it's a plugin. If you go to Astute Graphics, I'll go ahead and stop um, sharing right now. Okay. If you go to astutegraphics.com, um, it's called Vector Scribe. It's not just one tool. It has like 10 tools in it, and that's just one of the features. Uh, uh, a lot of people get hung up because it's about, I think it's like 70 bucks. But the thing is that the rounding tool, um, okay, I have to share this. You just have to see this. This is just, we're going to, I'm going to share my screen again because yes, Illustrator has rounding, but I'm sorry, it's just pathetic compared to Astute Graphics. So I'm just going to create a dumb little thing here really quick. And I, yeah. I will share the link. Uh, it'll be on the show notes. So it'll be in on iTunes, it'll be on YouTube, and it'll be on um, rechargingyou.com. Okay, so, back to you. So you can take any shape what that you want, um, organic or otherwise, it just happens to be 90 degrees. But there is the, the corner widget tool in Illustrator. What people don't know is they just ripped off Astute Graphics, but they implemented it in a half-assed way. Now, the reason why I say that is because they consulted me in the process of developing this, and I called them out saying, so you're just ripping off Astute Graphics. <laughs> That's like, and, and, and originally, they were going to release this, so it only worked on 90-degree corners uh, initially, and I told them, how long do you think it is before somebody starts using it and they discover it won't work on a non-90-degree corner? You're just going to piss people off. Don't do that. So it took them three more months until they got it to work on other angles. So with the these four, this tool, Dynamic Shapes, is really cool. Uh, this is called Dynamic Corners. This one I'll show you. Under this one, you have four different tools here. All of those work nice. And then you have what's called the Dynamic Measurement, which I don't use a lot, but I use every now and then. But we're going to focus on... Uh, the round corners and the way it works is you just grab any corner and you just start pulling it any way you want now let's say you want this exact radius you just click on it and click the next corner and it'll apply the same radius so wow. i i like this because in illustrator if you want to use their widget tool you have to highlight an anchor point otherwise it'll do it for everything and it's just, it's just, for me, it just gets in the way because let's say I'm zoomed out of this artwork. At times with Illustrator's implementation on rounding, if I go to select a corner at times, it'll trigger their widget and not the actual anchor point. And I'll actually round something by accident. So I actively um, uh, turn that off inside Illustrator uh, so I don't have to, to deal with it. So if you go to, um, let's see, view, I have this uh, corner widget hidden. And then within Illustrator's preferences, I believe it's under smart, uh, smart guides. Or, no, let's see, it's under, oh, under selection. I have it set to like 3%, so it never shows up. Um, 
when I'm doing that. So anyway, it's I highly recommend the plugin. Make sure to grab the free one though. The free one is uh, called what's it called? Subscribe. That doesn't cost anything, and I use that one all the time too. So uh, they're they're really great plugins. They're the nice thing is is they're moving forward now, and they're going to start creating other plugins for other software like uh, Photoshop and InDesign. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So um, T Scott says he took a class from you at the How conference years ago and got the plugin right after. So clearly it's been 70 bucks, a great investment probably. Yeah, so if it, it's going to literally save you time. So it's only going to take a couple projects and it'll pay for itself. It's a no-brainer. So um, Kent wants to know about... Um, talk about your work with illustrator development a little bit. And this is one of the things that I love about you is that you you just share, you'll reach out to them and you'll say, why did you do this? And you, but it's kind of like you being in the forums and how a long time ago and just sharing stuff. Now you might not uh, be uh, praising them, but you're telling them what's not working. So can okay. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So before I jump into this, I'll just say right up front that Adobe is a huge company. There's like thousands of employees. I tend to butt heads with the development side of that equation, meaning the actual engineers who program Illustrator and implement new features. I'm giving them crap all the time because they just, I'm sorry, they're just not that good at it in my opinion. Then there's the other side of the equation, and that's Adobe's creative people, meaning the actual creative people who work at Adobe, such as their creative director for the whole company. Um, like he invited me last two years, I'm speaking at, at his event at uh, Adobe Max. I get along with the creative side well. And actually, without naming names, there's many of those who really like the fact that I give crap about Illustrator because they're forced with the same problems but they can't say anything. Mm -hmm. So um, that said, I, I give the developers a bit of a blowback at times, but they are, I'll give them this, they're really nice. I like them. I was just at a conference last month and uh, they had their whole team from India there. They invited me to be part of this group of creative pros who gave them feedback. <laughs> we gave them a lot more than that. Um, <laughs> I was the first one to show up at that meeting. I walk in the room and I go, so is this where we show up to flog the engineers? You know, and they, <laughs> they, I think they got, I was joking. I was joking. But um, my big beef with them is they'll release updates that just make no damn sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So I go to record something for Linda for my weekly course. I'm in the middle of recording something and I'm saying something like, okay, if you select this shape and you look at the anchor points and I selected the shapes and you couldn't see the anchor points. I'm going, and so I'm thinking, did I turn something off? But I'm thinking this, but I don't want to screw up my recording. So I just keep going. I end the recording and then I'm going, what did I screw up on my machine? Cause it's a different machine than my workstation only to find out that the last update they pushed out, they removed the feature so that by default, when you select an, a, a vector shape, any vector shape, it no longer shows the anchor points on that shape. It's like they're trying to make Illustrator for people who don't like vectors. I'm just going, that makes no damn sense. Right. And they got so much blowback that they, the, they released a really quick update and they added a preference so you could turn that back on by default. But my point in saying this is that they'll release something like that where nobody is asking for that. Mm -hmm. Nobody. They just decide that's what they should do based out of their ignorance and then they get blowback. And then a feature that is fundamental to the core of building vectors when you drag another shape and you get to the other shape and it snaps to it, that's called snapping. It's been broken now in Illustrator for four years. And so I've been giving them crap over that for the last four years. And at this meeting last month, I was saying, when's that going to be fixed? And the, it, so they'll do one thing that nobody asked for and something else that is the basics of vector building, the fundamentals of vector building, and they totally ignore it. So, um, 
I, I'm hoping they said at Max last year, last October, that they're focusing on stability with Illustrator. I've yet to see any proof that's actually happening. They said at the meeting last month that they've improved it by 50%. And I just said, uh, sorry, that's bullshit. I don't see that at all. I think you're totally making that. You might see numbers, but mm -hmm. I don't think that's reflecting reality. And the other part about this is that it's, it, I pay now to use Illustrator every month, a subscription fee like everybody else who uses at least CC and above. And so I'm tracking all my crashes this year. Every time it crashes, I take the time to write out exactly what I was doing, what time it happened, and how much time it's going to cost me to get back to where I was at. So to track how much it's costing me to use their software. And at the end of the year, I told them, and I told them at this meeting that um, I'm going to do a state of uh, illustrator letter, open public letter at the end of the year, because, you know, they're, they're just not listening to, to mm -hmm. creative pros. So it gets and frustrating at times. Absolutely. And I appreciate you standing up for everybody and expressing it. Um, so I think that's a really good thing. We could track how much time, how many crashes and what's happening because it is super frustrating. Somebody asked um, two, three questions. Um, Anna wants to know, they need to do, or this is her comment, she wants to if you agree, um, if, if what they've done with DX, um, if they should do that, start from, rip it apart and build it up from the ground up. Do you think that that would be a smart thing to do for Illustrator? Um, DX. I don't I'm know not, what I think it's the the for the UX UI. I'm not sure if it's called oh, it. Okay. Yeah, I can't yeah, yeah. remember XD. I think it's what it's called actually. Okay. Um. Well, they supposedly did that like back when they released Creative Cloud from the ground up. It was a complete recode. Um. It didn't seem to didn't seem to change much. Um. The thing I found out last year in October at Max is that for the first time in 25 years, Illustrator has a larger user base than Photoshop now. You would think, that being the case, that they had focus on improving functionality and making it rock solid stable. And it's just not. It's not even close. And um, it's... I don't know. It gets really frustrating. I've been using it for 15 years. I used uh, freehand for 15 right. years. So equal time in both apps now. In 15 years of using freehand, there was only one release that was ever bad. And I ended up going back to version nine after that one came out. But other than that, I never, I can't even remember a crash happening. I know it probably did, but like next to never. I mean, literally next to never. Illustrator, last month alone, I had nine crashes. Whoa. Uh, March, I had 11. So this isn't just me. This is happening to most people who spend a lot of time in Illustrator. And um, it's just... It's just not, they call it a pro app. And in my opinion, it feels so much beta. And I think part of the problem is they're so focused on creative cloud and pushing that on people to try to, everything, marketing wise and everything is pushing people to use creative cloud. Uh, is that what a lot of people don't know is they only release updates every so often for the whole app but they're constantly pushing out um, updates that will update um, the coding, like mm -hmm. in your settings and stuff. And so I've noticed that little things will stop working or, or change. And I'm going, I haven't updated. What's going on? And why is this not working? It was working last week, only to find out and be confirmed by somebody at Adobe that, there's updates that they push out through Creative Cloud, whether you've, you have auto update on or not. I have auto update turned off on my workstation because I don't like rolling the dice and trying to work right. one day only to find out it's not working. I don't think they should be able to do that. That's the part I don't like is like, you should be able to cut off everything. If you, it's like if I bought software out of the box, I installed it, 
I used it until I absolutely had to have a new update. Right. Uh, and and we would let it go for a long time and yeah. it was a big purchase but you would probably you could get years of updates out of it and so i feel like they tried to make it more affordable for people but at the same time it's all about control right yeah it is so um a couple other questions so hannah wanted to know you seem like can, you're going can i say yes. can i say something really quick <laughs> yes I'm not going to get into it here. I'll just say this really quick. There's a couple friends of mine, and when we talk about things about Adobe, it actually becomes like a creative conspiracy hour. <laughs> we have this whole backstory that that we think we have some merit to, but um, anyway, I, don't, I shouldn't have brought that up. That's open up the can of worms. Anyway, <laughs> back to let's... Refocus. But it makes life Sorry. more in interesting for sure. Yes, well, uh, it does. Brian Brian White said we need to. Um, hopefully, Adobe doesn't have a hit squad, or we need to get you a bulletproof <laughs> vest for conferences. But I think no. it really it's really important that you're standing up. Like you're, um, I don't go to those conferences, so I uh, I know that a lot of people really really appreciate what you do on Twitter and what you are doing. Just instead of just being. You're just being real with them and saying, hey, this is not something, uh, My, I had four tires, now you've taken one of the tires off and I can't drive my car. And it, they, the engineers maybe were thinking that that was a good solution, taking that third tire off or something, you yeah. know, and it just isn't, I don't know. Uh, Apple does stuff like that too sometimes for me. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, why did they change that? Like it totally is different backwards from what I was thinking, but. They're, um probably one of the biggest problems that doesn't help is that the reason why I like astute graphics is because their plugins are so intuitive and there's a reason for that. The reason why they just work and they're easy to understand and start to work into your workflow is that the engineer behind them who does all the coding, he was actually a creative guy for years and learned how to code and he understands the mindset of the creative person. Compare that to Adobe with even Illustrator. I don't know much about the team for Photoshop and everything else, but with Illustrator, zero people on their, on their development team ever just create. And so mm -hmm. all of their ideas about features are all theoretical. They're not based off of actually doing the work. And I told Adobe years ago at a Max that, if they, they can afford this, if they just paid 10 developers or, or 10 beta testers who are actually creative pros, I'm not talking about engineer or evangelists, the people who know all the insides and outs of the, the tools. I don't care about that. I'm just talking about pick a, a, a branding specialist, pick a, uh, somebody who does a lot of, um, I don't know, layout and design, or just mm -hmm. different disciplines and then let them actually use the, pay them like a flat rate fee for that cycle. Like we're gonna pay you $25,000 to use our beta software to actually do your day in day work. That's gonna cover anything that you run into that causes problems. You know, your fee is gonna cover that, but in return, they can monitor that and they can track actual bugs that are preventing workflow, but they won't do that. I don't get that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Well, and Scott said this, um, they need a viable competitor. And so yeah, <laughs> Fabio definitely. was like, I use Corel Draw. He doesn't have these problems. But um, it, I think I think you probably still have issues. But I think Adobe is really big and they can, they just haven't, I don't know, sometimes I feel like they don't um, understand that we're their we are their people and they need to listen instead of, I think part of the company, like you were saying. So uh, uh, Kent asked this, he said, what is your relationship like with them? Is it, um, and I can't remember Kit exactly, I'm trying to find it, but um, is the relationship official or offered because you're so successful and they need to listen? Um, I wouldn't say official, I haven't <laughs> signed anything for them. Um, but I, I think it's the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of mentality. Um, 
I, I frankly, I use Illustrator every day, almost all day long. So um, I, I don't think everybody uses Illustrator that much. And so they just don't run into all the various issues, um, I guess. I don't know. Um, but so nothing official, but uh, they do, they at least give the perception that they listen, but I don't see, I've given them source files and videos showcasing the snapping thing four years ago and just as recently as February again. And I've yet to see any resolution to that core problem. And I run into that every single day when I'm doing branding work. Right. Um, if you want to see what I'm talking about, just uh, set any type. doesn't matter what the type is. Convert it to paths draw some box and just try to drag it over and snap it to the side of the letter form. Um, you're going to run it. It'll act at times like no letter form is there whatsoever. You can't snap it at all. That doesn't sound like a big thing, but that's like fundamental. I shouldn't have to build another shape just to make sure it's aligned. And it just slows. It's just, it's just bad. It's right. just and bad. it used to work. Yeah, and that, yeah, that's the thing. It used to work. Some somewhere between CS6 and CC, they broke it. Hmm. And and I'm not. A lot of people don't realize, but there was a CS6 Creative Cloud version, and it was between that and the official CC that they broke it somehow, and they've just never fixed it. So hmm. I don't know. So Hannah had a question about: Do you use the other program? So like the thing for one sort one stop pro, um, that had. In design, probably as well. So, are you mainly? You just said you were mainly using Illustrator every day. Are um, you using other programs? I use Photoshop all the time. Um, actually, everything I've done for One Stop Pro, including the brochure, I just I prefer using Illustrator for that. Other than uh, uh, InDesign. InDesign. That that said, when I get to something that like I've done. Um, some print collateral for a private school back east and it was a whole booklet i'm not going to lay that out in, in illustrator so i don't i don't i can use indesign i just don't enjoy doing that kind of stuff so what i do when it comes to that need is there's a local designer friend of mine called josh and i'll just contact him and i'll push the project his way and I'll just mark it up and art direct it, provide him with assets needed, and just let him do it. He's a great layout designer, does a lot of publication stuff. I just don't focus on that. So right. um, that's when I'll kick into art director mode and just handle it that way. Well, I also think that you know what your strengths are, yeah. and then you're able to use your, your relationships and the people around you to get you – to where you need to be because it you might not be as fast or it is not as enjoyable. You would rather do some of the other things. So I know we're really running out of time. I want to make sure I share a bunch of different links and then you are going to give away two posters, which I'm going to share what that poster is, but he does have it right behind him, but I'm going to show what the poster is that where uh, Vaughn's going to give away. Can you guys see that poster? It's super awesome. And yes. now I can't see the chat, so I can't see people talking. But <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to pick um, two random numbers, and I am going to – or I'm going to – Vaughn, how about you pick two random numbers, and then I'm going to go through the chat and – Between uh, one and 100 or something? Um, I think we probably have 100 chat messages. So between one and 100. If it's me or you, Vaughn, we're not going to um, accept the poster. I will go to the next one down or the closest one down that's a new person. So Okay. <laughs> Evan uh, says, please, please. Okay. How about we'll start with uh, 77? Okay, 77. And, and I don't know, 48. And 48. Okay, I can get number 48 uh, pretty quickly. Um, let's see. Well, I'll, I'm going to have to get it in just a second. So let me share your links. You've done a bunch of books. I'm going to share those as well. Um, I had asked later on, and I'm going to actually just, if it's okay with you, I'll just um, copy paste from the answers that you had typed up for me. 
um, the I had asked about how do I know which brush to use? Uh, like I've bought Dustin and yours. Uh, it's your brushes that you sell bleh, sell yeah. through Retro Graphic Retro Supply, um, and with that you said watch this video on Linda. So I'm gonna and all these are gonna be in the show notes as well. But it's a um, a video which is pretty much called Ve Drawing Vector Graphics and Painting Vectors. So he's, that's what he told me to do. So I'm going to share that one. And then these are all your books. And the second book that I'm listing, is the one of the cheapest ones is $211. And we uh, that's that, because it's out of, that, out of print. But yes. you can get that on the Kindle. So... Um, it, it's all there. So vector basic training, take and make art is the one that's just on the Kindle. Flourish banner frame, that comes with a CD. Like it comes with a bunch of stuff. Like I love those. Drip dot swirls the same way. Crumble, crackle, burn. All three come with like graphics um, a, that you can use. And then design logo, which you did with Paul. And then um, let's see. I'm just going to share Savannah's um, use shared it already but uh savannah fairy f-a-e-r-i-e -E, on instagram and doodle frog on twitter and then i'm going to share all of your links and pretty much on um twitter i believe you're at vonster right yes and then um here's some of the other ones so glitchka is g-l-i-t-s-c-h K A studios with an S at the end.com and then drawing vector graphics.com and then D V D as in, I don't know what the D stands drawing vectors, D V D V G drawing vector graphics, D V G lab. Okay. That's the drawing vector graphics laboratory. It's the weekly series. I gotcha. And then, um, at Vonster on Twitter, and I've just posted all that in on Dribble, three Bs for dribble.com slash Vonster, V O N S T E R, and then Instagram is V Glitchka. So that way you guys can all stay in touch and connect and make sure you're following Vaughn. Um, I was trying to see, um, I did, we have all the astute graphics, Paul, um, Paul's website, stuff like that too. So let me really quickly get to. <laughs> Woo, I, fell over. I saw that you made me lose my count one two <laughs> should have just had one pulled off already okay so this is the poster okay so it looks like uh, crystal Reynolds, if you are still on, can you, um, Crystal, do you know Crystal? I'm not giving her a poster. I'm just kidding. That's fine. <laughs> okay. So that was number 48. So, cause you guys aren't seeing all that we see. We see a bunch more just so you know. Um, all right. So then 50. And seven more. One, two, three, four, five, six. That was so Jason Frost home. So you get the other one. That is the 77th. Jason. So I can um if Crystal, I don't know if I have your information, but if you want to email me at Diane at recharging you dot com, your your um address jason i have your phone number so i can get your address so um anyway thanks guys and thanks Vaughn, for giving away two posters no problem and i just so you guys know next week i'm taking uh, the week off i guess i've just been i just didn't schedule anything i may show some italy pictures there were some amazing pieces of art even though pictures don't um, do justice. But if I decide to do it, I'll let you know. But the week after, I have the letter uh, pressing on. It's a letterpress um, a documentary. It's a full-length film, and they're doing um, 
they're going to be on the show talking about how they came up with that uh, as a something to do a documentary on. And so it's really cool. So I hope you guys will join in two weeks. Um, I don't know what that date is. I'd have to look at the calendar, but it's two weeks from today. And pretty much that's it. So Vaughn, thank you. Thanks for being an inspiration to me. And I super appreciate um, everything that you have done just for us as designers and illustrators and just um, for me just to be able to inspire me to keep going and just to be really approachable. So I, I really appreciate that. And you're getting a ton of thank yous over there in the chat too. So um, the, oh, it, maybe it is the 20, the 21st. I think Brian Yan had it. So anyway, thank you guys. And thank you, Vaughn. And thank you for everybody hanging out for a good long time. And I appreciate you getting passionate about help make, Helping Adobe be better. They, they, I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. All right. Well, we'll see you guys in two weeks. Thanks, Vaughn. Ciao.